Good morning, Duck Church. It is good to gather for worship this morning. And as we gather, you know, if we ask God to restore us to the way that we've been, then we have not asked for as much as God intends to give. God is not content simply to return or restore us to former things. Instead, God seeks to give the gift of resurrection, a new and abundant life. With confidence in God's generosity, we confess our sins and seek the new life offered in Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me? Loving God, we confess that we have sinned. Even though we want to do what is right, we did not always succeed this week. Not only did we fail to do what was right, but at times we consciously chose to think and act in ways we knew were wrong. We are truly sorry, and we ask for your forgiveness. Help us to remember who we are in Christ and conform us to his image. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Friends, hear this. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have been set free from the power of sin. It no longer needs to control us. So be at peace. Your sins are forgiven. Now live in the light of Christ. Thanks be to God. And as thankful people who gather for the purpose of worship on this All Saints Day, Let's join our voices together as we sing for all the saints, followed by Faith of Our Fathers.
As we come to our time for morning prayer on this All Saints Day, I invite you to pray with me where you are. Let us pray. Living God, in whom there is no shadow or change, we thank you for the gift of life eternal and for all those who, having served you well, now rest from their labors. We thank you for all the saints remembered and forgotten, for those dear souls most precious to us. Today we give thanks for those who have died and entered into your glory. We name them before you. Diane Ashworth, Chris Idlett Sr., Richard Deans, Karen DeSanto, Nancy Flanagan, John Forbes, Evelyn Forbes, Johnny Forbes, George Georgeopolis, Charles Robert Godfrey, John Jenkins, Madeline Klein, Joe Less, Elizabeth Martinez, Thomas Morey, Barbara Moore, Lorraine Myers, Mary Lee Pittard, Joe Weagle. We bless you for their life and love and rejoice for them, mindful of all those souls who have gone on ahead of us. Teach us as 21st century disciples of every race and place to follow their example to the best of our ability, to feed the poor in body or spirit, to support and comfort the mourners and the repentant, to encourage the meek and stand with them in crisis to affirm those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, to cherish and learn from the merciful, to be humbled by and stand with the peacemakers. Let us clearly recognize what it means to be called the children of God and to know we are to be your saints, neither by our own inclination nor in our own strength, but simply by the call and the healing holiness of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Good morning, I'm Sue Jordan, and I attend the 8 o'clock service. Join me in the morning prayer, Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now we are invited to worship God in a very tangible way through the giving of tithes and offerings. Compassionate God, we ask that you bless and multiply these gifts, that they may be used to proclaim the glory of your kingdom, and make known to all people the power of your saving acts through Jesus Christ. Amen. And now a message just for kids. The story today is about a lost son. Stories of the Bible. The parable of the lost son. This is Jesus. Hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love. He healed many people from their sickness, performed many miracles like calming storms, and even raised people from the dead. Jesus taught everyone about God's love, all kinds of people would come to hear Jesus speak, including tax collectors and people who made bad choices. This made the Pharisees and Jewish leaders mad. 
Ah, yuck. They didn't think that Jesus should be around these kind of people. So Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, Um, excuse me? I want my share of your estate now, before you die. Okay. So his father agreed and gave his son his inheritance. A woohoo! A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings. See ya! And moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. Aw, oh, man! And he began to starve. Hey, you! He convinced a local farmer to hire him. Thank you! And the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the food he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. Finally, he said to himself, at home even the servants have food enough to spare, and here I'm dying of hunger. I know. I will go home to my father and apologize and ask him to take me on as a servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. Sir! His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. All right, yeah! Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. Huh? Hey, you! And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. Woohoo! All right! Party time! All right! Yahoo! The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. Ah, oh, man! But he replied, All these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after wasting your money, you celebrate by giving him a great feast. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now, he is found. Let us affirm what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his Son and our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pompous Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let's sing together, forever.
stars they wept The morning sun was dead The Savior of the world was fallen His body on the cross His blood poured out for us The weight of every curse upon him One final breath he gave This heaven looked away The Son of God was laid in dark
Our scriptures today comes from Romans 7. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I do, don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. And I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyways. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. So today we're starting a new series that I'm excited about. I, I believe this series has great potential if you'll hear God's word and apply it to your life over the next few weeks. In fact, I believe that this can re redirect the trajectory of, of so many lives in a direction that would not only be God-honoring, but would also really help make our lives different. And so in this series, we're going to talk about habits. Why do habits matter? Because successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. Spiritually successful people are consistently living the disciplines that help them grow close to God. If you've got someone that's financially successful, they're consistently doing things that other people will only occasionally or maybe never do. Relationally, Physically, it's all about small things leading uh, in a direction of big things over time. If you look at, let's say, who is successful in Scripture, I think we could all agree that Jesus was incredibly successful at pleasing God. I think we would say that, that Paul was incredibly successful pleasing God. If you look at their lives, one thing I can tell you is that Jesus never, ever said I just can't find the time to pray. I'm so busy, and these disciples, they're wearing me out. Peter just gets up on, on my nerves all the time. I, I wish I had more time to spend with God, but I just don't have the time to spend with God. Jesus never, ever said that. What you'll see is a consistent habit of breaking away from the crowds to have intimate fellowship with God. The Apostle Paul, he didn't make excuses. You know, there's a verse in scripture that said he had the habit of going to the temple to share his faith with those who were not in the family of God. Habits matter. Successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. I like, I like what uh, Sean Covey said. He said, and I quote, our habits will make or break us. We become what we repeatedly do, end quote. Now we're soon coming up on the time of the year that people are going to be creating New Year's resolutions. It is really just around the corner. And that's the, the good news that people want to change. The bad news is that according to studies, 92% of your New Year's resolutions will be gone by Valentine's Day. 92%. That's bad news. And you know it from last January. You had the goal, the resolution, and for most people in most cases, it doesn't last. And you end up feeling like the Apostle Paul in his writings in Romans 7 when he said this, I don't really understand myself, for I want to stop eating junk food. I want to stop procrastinating. I want to stop overspending at Walmart, whatever it is. I want to do what's right, he says, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I want to do right, he says, but I can't. I want to do good, but I don't. I don't want to do that which is wrong, but I do it anyway. And then he does what so many of us do. He connects his failure to his identity. And he says, oh, what a miserable person I am. What a failure. I'm not disciplined. I'm not becoming more like Christ. What a miserable person. And then he asked the question, and we see him 
uh, really shifting in his thinking. He says, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? And he looks to the source, the only one who can truly change him. And he says, thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord, who can change us, who can deliver us, and who can set us free. Christ is our source. Christ is our strength. Christ is our healing. Christ is our hope. Christ is the one who makes all things new. It doesn't matter who we were, where you were, what you did, where you've been. With Christ, he takes all things and makes them new. If anyone is in Christ, they are a new person. The old is gone and the new has come. Now, my prayer is that you will not only experience all the life available to you in Christ, but that you would live out the disciplines that lead to a God-honoring, God-pleasing, successful life because successful people do consistently what other people do occasionally. Now, why is it that so many of us, we, we genuinely have good intentions, we want to lose the weight, we want to do the whatever, but we fail again and again. Well, I want to show you three reasons why we don't succeed when we have such good intentions. And the first reason is that we focus on the what, but we don't understand the how. We focus on the action that we want to perform, the thing that we want to accomplish, but we don't understand how to get there. I mean, think about it. Almost everybody that you know has, for the most part, similar goals. If we were to survey a hundred of you and said, what's really important to you in your life, most of you would say things that fall into the same general categories. Most of you would say something about uh, that you want to be healthy in some form. I don't know anybody who's saying, you know, my goal next year is to have dangerously high cholesterol. You know, when it comes to finances, most people say, you know, I, I want to be free. I want to be out of debt. I want to be able to be generous. Relationships. We all want good relationships. Spiritually, we want to be close to God. We, you want to make a difference in this world. You want your life to matter. Most of us have very similar goals or hopes, but the results are dramatically different. Some are really achieving what they want and others are falling away way short. In fact, winners and losers genuinely have the same goals. Successful people and unsuccessful people have the same goals. Think about it. At the beginning of any season in sports, what does the coach say to the team? The coach has the same goal as every other coach. We want to win the championship. I don't know any coaches that say, hey, this year we're shooting for fifth place. It's going to be amazing. Nobody's doing that, right? When somebody gets married, what do people want? We want love. We want a blessed life. We want to be happy. Nobody's saying our goal is to make it five years, maybe seven, and then divorce is in the cards. Nobody does that. We all want something similar, but we end up with different results. Why? Because goals don't determine success. Systems determine success. You don't rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. Now, you may say that doesn't sound really spiritual at all. But when we read the Bible through the lens of, of, of that thought, we see examples all over the place of people being successful because of godly systems or unsuccessful because of the lack of systems. Look at Daniel. He's a fantastic guy. I mean, if we want to model uh, after the life of someone who stood out and had great faith, I want to be like Daniel. Why was Daniel successful? Why did he stand out to all the leaders as godly, gifted, talented, and different? Why is it that when he was thrown into a den of lions because of his obedience to God, 
He was able to stand strong, trusting God and come out alive on the other side. It's because he had the systems in place that led to a life of faith and faithfulness. So what was his system? For years and years and years, Daniel had predecided that three times a day, every day, he would stop to spend time with God. Three times a day. If you want to grow in your faith, and if you want to be more faithful, you will not rise to the level of your goals. You'll fall to the level of your systems, your habits, if you will. If you have systems in place that build your faith, strengthen your knowledge and intimacy with God, then you will more likely become the person that you want to become. Now, I need to caution you because here's the mistake that we tend to make. We tend to think, I want to change the results. I want to, you know, I want to lose 20 pounds by Christmas. I, I want to be more organized. I want to finally pay off that one credit card that's been with me so long. You know, whatever it is. The problem is this. We need to change the systems that create those results, the habits. If we fix what we do, how we live, the habits in our life, the outcomes will fix themselves. So why don't we succeed? Well, number one, we tend to focus on the what, but we don't necessarily understand the how. So the second reason that we give up so quickly and 92% of our New Year's resolutions fail is because we don't see progress fast enough. And you know this, you, you've been in some area of your life where you're going to walk on the treadmill three days that week, and then you get on the scale and you gain two pounds. I mean, this doesn't work, right? Well, we wrongly conclude this small God-honoring habit, this small faithful decision, this small good and positive action doesn't make that big of a difference at all. And then you take the flip side, the not-so-good things. What do you do? You skip church for a weekend, and your whole world doesn't fall apart. Nothing tragic happens to you spiritually. You eat a third of a box of chocolates and nothing changes. And, and so then you wrongly conclude that the small bad decisions don't impact your life that much. The small good decisions don't really move the needle. The small bad decisions don't matter that much. And you miss the truth of what is impacting your life in massive ways. And that is that our life is the sum total of all the decisions that we make. Who you are today is a result of every single small decision that you've made along the way. They all matter, and they all add up over time. I like the way the Apostle Paul said it to the believers in Galatia. He said this in Galatians 6, 9. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. He said, let's not become weary in honoring God. Let's not become weary in doing the right things. Let's not become weary in living by a budget. Let's not become weary in counting calories. Let's not become weary in getting up 30 minutes earlier to seek God. Let's not become weary in fasting before our God. Let's not get weary in getting the proper exercise. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Now, why do we uh, tend to fail so often? We focus on the what. We don't understand the how. We don't see progress fast enough. And this is a big problem. So number three, our distorted identity sabotages our success. You see, our enemy tries to connect our failures to identity. You failed, so you're a failure. You did bad, therefore you are bad. And that's what happened to the Apostle Paul. He said, I try and I try to do what's right, and I don't do what's right. Oh, what a miserable person I am. When you look at some of the most effective people in God's word, you see people who battled with identity issues. 
In the Old Testament, somewhere along the way, Moses didn't live up to his own expectations. And so when God called him, he said, I'm not a good public speaker. I'm not a good leader. He identified some failure with who he was, and that sabotaged his potential. The same is true with Gideon. Gideon was nervous, and he took that failure, that shortcoming, identified with it, and he said, I'm the weakest and the least in my community. Listen to me. Identity shapes actions. When you know who you are, you know what to do. So who do you want to be? Well, you know who you are, then you know the right thing to do. The do overflows out of the who. Don't start with the do, start with the who. Who do you want to be? The problem is that because of how we see ourselves, we may say, but this is just who I am, I can't change. Romans chapter six, verses six and seven says this. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Now, you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. When you know who you are, you'll know what to do. Who are you in Christ? You are redeemed of the Lord. You are righteous in Christ. You are more than a conqueror. You're an overcomer. You're blessed that you can do all things, not by your own power, but through Christ who gives you strength. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who can deliver me from this body of death? Oh, thanks be to God. His son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, can set me free. Identity shapes actions. When you know who you are, you'll know what to do. So who do I want to be? I want to be like Christ. Because if I'm like Jesus, I'm full of love, full of grace, full of truth. I reflect the love of God in this world. I want to become like Jesus, conform me to his image. And if you're becoming more like Christ, you know who you are, then you know what to do. Listen, maybe you have spiritual thoughts, but you're never really consistent. Maybe you believe in God, but you never can seem to quite get it right for him. Maybe you're not even like a God person at all, but there's something that's drawing you to God right now. And you don't really know where you stand with God. I want you to think about who Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. His name is above every single name. One day, every knee is going to bow to that name. Every tongue is going to confess his lordship. If you're living for anything else, then you are shooting way too low. God loves you so much that he sent Jesus to show you his love. Jesus loved the unrighteous. Jesus loved the sinners. Jesus loved those who never, ever got it right. Jesus became sin for us as the perfect sacrifice on the cross. God raised Jesus from the dead so that anyone who calls on his name would be completely forgiven. Look, maybe there's something in your past, that weight of your sin that follows you, that shame, the guilt. Anyone who's in Christ, their sins are forgiven. They're made completely new. What I hope you can understand is that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So if you recognize that Jesus is not first in your life, today, make him first. Make him Lord. All who say, I need his forgiveness, I need his grace, when you call on his name, he hears your prayer and he makes you new. That's the very reason that you're here today. And I believe you can sense that. I need his forgiveness. I turn from my sin. 
I turn toward Jesus. I give my life to him. Let me pray for you. Would you just bow your head right now? Father, I pray that you would just breathe life into this. This doesn't have to be formal. But years from now, this is really who I want others to know that I am. This is what I stand for. And then, God, in the weeks to come, we thank you that the do is going to flow out of the who. More than anything else, more than being a good leader, a good dad, a good husband, a good mom, more than anything else, God, help us to be like your son, Jesus. So I want to invite you to say today that I will seek God and listen to him on who he wants me to become. It's going to start with the who. Now, I know it's a real ask. This isn't something that you just do in three minutes. It might take you five, might take you 10, might take you longer. But if you're willing to do that, would you just lift up your hand and surrender to God? Just lift it up where you are. Doesn't matter who's around, doesn't matter. Just lift it up while we pray because I want to invite you to pray aloud with me right now. So would you just keep your hand lifted up and would you join me as we pray? Heavenly Father, I surrender to you. Jesus, be first, the Savior and the Lord of my life. Fill me with your spirit so I can follow you, so I can live for you. My life is not mine. I give it all to you. Thank you for new life. Now you have mine. Father, help us to be like Jesus. Do a work within us, O God. Stir up your church to have great goals, not just for the things in this world, but to be all who you call us to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Our closing song today is What a Beautiful Name. Let's sing it together.
May God lead you to be more faithful and obedient in your walk with Jesus, that you might become more like him day by day. The blessing of God most wonderful, whom saints have trusted as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you now and forevermore. Amen. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name.